Uh, we're we're uh, very lucky to have, I think, some of the uh, uh, really, frankly, world's greatest experts in the topics that are everyone's talking about. We heard about it from Peter on Monday, the, whether it's machine learning, whether it's adaptive learning, et cetera. Um, these uh, four gentlemen, and, and we are going to work on the girls in this group, but um, these four gentlemen uh, are really extraordinary uh, in what they have done around building real product that re has real efficacy uh, and real results um, that, are fe that are having huge impacts in the, in the learning space. So we're delighted to have them all here. Bill's going to lead the conversation. Um, the first thing I want them to do is build an algorithm for how you design seating at dinner tables because <laughs> is ruining my life. Um, <laughs> and I'm really sorry that we sat all the, the, re the executive recruiters in the same table. That was like, <laughs> the algorithm would definitely not have done that if we'd had it in charge. But anyway, <laughs> you don't have to talk about that, Bill. All right. Okay. Um, we got, uh, don't worry. I don't uh, need to be seen. Uh, so uh, look, our uh, job today is to talk to people who are at the front line. And I think uh, trying to figure out how to introduce technology into different settings, uh, there are a lot of things we can cover in terms of customer adoption, the role of uh, funding mechanisms, uh, how one builds a company culture, uh, how one thinks about uh, the evolution of the company, what's the end game that you're trying uh, to accomplish. Uh, how do you measure your success? So I thought maybe each of you could start with an elevator pitch version of who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. So you're sitting next to me, Stephen. Sure. So thank you. And my former colleague and friend. Absolutely. So hi, Stephen Laster from McGraw-Hill Education. I've been with McGraw-Hill for about four years. Um, I joined the day after our owners dumped us <laughs> and sold us to private <laughs> equity. Um, and it was really at that moment of being the sort of paternalistically held operating unit of a very large, successful financial services company, Standard & Poor's, that we had to decide, you know, who are we and who are we going to be? And we had been a 125-year-old textbook publisher and had made major contributions, we believe, to education. But as you all told us, we lost all relevancy in the world. And so at that moment in time, what we really did is step back and said, what problem are our users hiring us to solve, right? And so it was really about becoming a learning science company. It's about understanding how people learn, understanding how to build curriculum, and taking that base knowledge and reinterpreting it in ways that were engaging, easy to use, efficient, and effective. And it was about doing it in an open ecosystem. Because the one thing we were sure to the core of our beliefs is that education is not a winner-take-all place. Um, and that's the beauty of education. It's many, many firms and institutions and for-profits and not-for-profits working together in service of moving people forward. And so that's the problem we've been solving uh, with great clarity for the past four years and bringing to bear on that problem our history of really understanding how to build curriculum, how to design courseware, understanding deeply what happens in that learning moment, K through continuing professional education. And then over the past few years, really through acquisition uh, and through internal development, bringing together some of the world's best technologists to say how do we take all of that and deliver it in a way that drives this social relationship, teaching and learning, through technologies to create new opportunities and new efficiencies. And that's the journey that, the incomplete journey that we're on today. Maybe you will come back and, and talk about how you think about the, the culture you inherited sure. and how that maps onto either the competitive space or the changing nature of the people who are acquiring your services. So we'll come back to that Great. if we can, Elson. So I'm the co-founder of Declara. Declara is a four and a half year old company. We're based in Palo Alto. And when Ramona Pearson and I started the company four and a half years ago, we were quite inspired by our background in education, K-12, higher ed, uh, the whole gamut. But also the twin challenge that at that moment, about five years ago, OECD had defined as the skills to labor gap, but also the skills to labor mismatch. And we thought that was a very well put um, 
a statement because we talk a lot about the fact that we need to reskill and upskill our workforce, our students. That's obvious. We're all working on that. But there's also a twin problem, which is the skills to labor mismatch, which is more around organizational design, around、uh, human capital management systems, and around thinking about how do we use the people we have differently by reconfiguring the organization itself. And so we saw that as a meta-level challenge that we wanted to face.、Um, and at a more micro level, we thought that the wonderful technologies being built up and up and down 101 and 280 were being applied for things like ad placement and、uh, uh, hedge fund management, but not so much for the the human、uh, task of becoming, right, of of learning uh, and uh, enabling、uh, human potential. And so we wanted to bring together the cognitive neurosciences and、uh, AI, machine learning,、uh, NLP. All those good things to try to see if we could actually、uh, help improve the learning process.、Um, and the specific problem that we saw and we wanted to solve、uh, in that skills to labor mismatch and、um, uh, and gap was how we facilitate and measure social learning. Because as we all know,、uh, data or learning science has told us that 70% of how we learn as adults we learn by doing. On the job, figuring problems out,、uh, and therefore, what's needed is less a learning platform than a performance support engine.、Uh, and so, that 70% of, of learning that happens by doing isn't supported by the kinds of learning management systems or course-taking platforms that are very excellent, but tend to focus on that 10% of learning that happens through training,、uh, and uh, the uh, 20% and the 10% that happens through、uh, coaching and, and more formal mechanisms. And so, in order to face that challenge of, of enabling and measuring social learning, we created、uh, a social learning and collaborative curation platform that essentially uses teams and、uh, in collections and annotation in text and in video annotation to try to understand the behavioral trajectories of people who are trying to figure out problems. On the job, whether that on the job is、uh, as a higher ed student, as a professor, or、uh, a geneticist at, at Genentech,、um, and so we、uh, created a first version of the product.、Um, it did very well. We raised a very large Series A. GSV is our lead investor. Very proud of that.、Um, but we realized we weren't going to scale as quickly as we needed to. So we made a fairly radical pivot about a year and a half ago. Painful, but we we landed it,、uh, and now we have a much more elegant, distilled、uh, consumer-first product that has an enterprise layer on top of it, and、uh, we're now selling that into companies and governments around the world. And the two use cases that we're serving are learning and development, and the social, informal, curatorial aspects of social learning, but also innovation and ideation. How do we learn our way toward problems for which we yet don't have solutions, and how do we de-silo and and make more intelligent? Um, those processes, and we do all of that through what we call the cognitive graph,、uh, which is a way that we measure engagement and influence, the critical pre and post cursors of deep learning, as we know, of, of social learning. So essentially, we're learning how to put hard measures on soft interactions, and thereby improve、uh, adult learning. It, also, for us to keep in mind,、uh, that's a complicated story, right?、Uh, only for experience, slow、yeah. people like me. <laughs> So one question is, how do you get the customer to really understand why it is that they're going to adopt,、yeah. and how do you price it, and think about this input-output、uh, uh, measurement over what time would they see the benefit of that、mm -hmm. as an organization or as an individual, and then how do you how do you、uh, get the right value proposition for them? So we'll come back to that.、Great. All right. Good morning. I'm Ulrich Christensen.、Um, I'm the chairman of Area Nine Group. We're most known. By most of you guys for the work we did with、uh, McGraw Hill, but、uh, my journey started 22 years ago, when I was still in med school, and we were starting to look at why do doctors and nurses make errors when they get put under pressure. And it was an interesting thing, so we started to build simulators to get environments to look at these,、um, and to build safe environments where we could test and do research and why that happened. It became relatively clear that a large part of this actually. Relates to seventy、uh, percent, if, if that's the case in medicine as well. I haven't seen numbers on it. Not happening from actually trying to learn some things, because it was really clear that it was not just related to teamwork. That was the original hypothesis. It was not just related to lack of checklists. It was actually not just related to、um, clinical decision making and, and applying the knowledge the right way. It became clear during the late '90s that it was much much deeper. So we began to design computer simulators. Um, and the biggest problem in making a simulator is actually not making the simulator that can be hard enough. The biggest problem is to build the debriefing, at least if you have to rely on a computer doing it. 
So we built technology that uh, we could get uh, even specialist physicians to accept the feedback they were getting on how to improve their clinical care. Um, we sold that company a month before I graduated to Lerl um, Medical, and that later became the platform for a lot of the uh, medical simulators that are out there. Worked there for about four years. And this journey is important to where we actually ended up because during that work we found out that a much, much larger problem of the performance problem postgraduately actually appeared to be, have roots way back into middle and high school. So we started and failed in the early 2000s building like hardcore tutoring um, systems that could drill stuff into their heads because the hypothesis was if we could lower the cognitive workload, they, we would be able to allocate more cognitive attention to actually dealing with the higher order problems that were uh, killing patients every day. Um, we were seeing some really, really problematic behaviors, but we couldn't solve them just through the amount of simulation we could put people through. So in 2006, seven, we partnered up with McGraw-Hill. It's actually something that from an entrepreneurial standpoint was a really unique partnership. So we aligned our interests. We voluntarily on both sides for a long time were exclusive. Worked together to build what turned out to be um, a solution to a much larger problem than we anticipated when we started because we had peeled the layers off this onion. We thought it was a highly complex human interaction problem. And now we're down to how do we eliminate the cognitive workload of learning 16,000 learning objectives in a two semester biology course? And how do we make sure that people don't leave college so overloaded that the brain chest is already so, over, uh, so filled up that it's crammed in there, they cannot get to learn the things that were leading to human errors. So what it turned out to be was it was a much more basic problem than we originally thought. We're now working ourselves way, uh, on, we're on our way back to this, adding more simulation, adding more complex problem solving to it, because we can see that if we lower that cognitive workload, we begin to clear up space and attention for this. So we've built, I don't know how many, we've built 1,500 of these. So it's a big step at the problem, so it, it is pretty uh, widespread in American colleges. Um, it has transpired back into medicine, so uh, the group I'm leading now is doing the England Journal of Medicine's platforms and a number of others. Um, so it is actually getting back into the postgraduate world, but slowly. So this is probably a 10, 20 year process before we begin to eat into this problem we were studying in 20 years ago. Great, Elijah. Hi, um, so I began my work in education at Carnegie Mellon uh, as a PhD student working on machine learning and natural language processing uh, affiliated with the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center. Um, I did a lot of work there on text understanding in education and healthcare applications. And in 2012 was asked by uh, the Hewlett Foundation, Smarter Balance, Park uh, over, over a couple of months to focus on the question of automated essay scoring because of some operational and logistic challenges they were having around the rollout of the Common Core in K-12. Um, I dug into that problem further uh, while doing this consulting and recognized that actually there's a much deeper problem at hand, uh, which is that as students are in the classroom, uh, especially in the English language arts classroom, they're not getting the opportunities to write. Um, they're not getting the under, uh, understanding of how to go through the writing process. Um, there was a slide up there uh, yesterday that said that 21st century literacy is about learning and unlearning and relearning instead of reading and writing. It's been my impression working in schools that it's in fact still reading and writing uh, that are the key aspect of literacy that students are really struggling with in a lot of ways. Um, and it's because teachers don't have the opportunity to give them enough practice. Um, they don't have the resources, the time, uh, the support from vendors um, to, to really encourage writing throughout the year uh, and to let students build up those skills. Uh, and so I left Carnegie Mellon uh, midway through my PhD to start a company, Lightshead Labs, uh, focused on giving classroom teachers a product that would let them assign writing all the time, uh, let them give students immediate support uh, with automated feedback that in the end is powered by machine learning, powered by a lot of the same algorithms that are used for automated essay scoring, um, but is oriented around that process of building up core writing skills uh, and gives teachers the opportunity to get through a lot more material, give students a lot more opportunities, uh, and have them, you know, when they do get to the assessment at the end of the road, um, be prepared in a way that they just fundamentally couldn't be if the technology was being focused on the assessment aspect of this work. Um, two years after starting that company, 
Uh, we were approached by Turnitin, uh, which has, at this point, somewhere between 25 and 30 million users worldwide. Their focus has historically been on plagiarism uh, and originality in writing, uh, have started to move towards uh, teacher feedback on student work. Um, but they asked us if we would be interested in a combination and really being taken over by that company and then leading their new product development to really expand their area of focus and make it more about improving student skills, being a partner with the institutions and with the instructors throughout the process of learning. Uh, so that, again, just like with assessment, thinking less about the final result and more about the process that students go through, doing the same thing in SaaS software that is being used in the writing classroom, uh, being a part of that education throughout the entire school year and really building up the students along the way. Uh, maybe you could talk about who the customer, who actually purchases your side of that. We can sort of understand plagiarism and trying to make sure kids aren't uh, uh, doing bad things, but who, who buys it? Who do you have to convince? Uh, what's the sales effort look like? Uh, yeah. How did the, your alignment with Turn It In work? Yeah, so we focused uh, this year, this is our first year really trying to build out a commercial base around the product in US K-12, uh, and particularly looking at district-level relationships uh, a lot of our most successful rollouts have been with 10 or 15,000 students across many buildings. Um, a challenge with Turnitin historically is that they sell into the IT office. Um, and there's someone in, in the tech help desk that is purchasing plagiarism tools for the entire uh, school district, the entire building, or potentially the entire university, depending on the institution. With the work that we're doing, it's often the curriculum office. And it's the people uh, a couple layers higher at the district level that are looking at what opportunities their students are getting on writing. <laughs> Um, and saying that there's just no way that they could expect to improve their performance on writing if they're not giving them more opportunities. And there's no way to do that for the English teachers today. It's just not a problem that they can solve by, you know, adding more uh, technology. You need to add more changes to the way that teachers assign work, changes to the things that students are doing throughout the year, and that a tool like Revision Assistant from Turnitin um, gives those teachers the ability to shuffle around and really change the way that they're teaching writing. And you need to make that case at the superintendent's office. You need to say that this is a cultural shift in how much focus we're going to put on literacy in our school district. And then from there, they can say, we want to put the scaffolds in place. We want to roll this out across the district so that English teachers understand what this means for them, understands how their classroom needs to change, uh, and they understand what their students are going to be doing differently uh, and what um, the classroom looks like when the students are turning in their 11th draft uh, instead of turning in their, their first draft. Um, the students are much more empowered around the writing process. The students are thinking more about how they can improve their writing. Um, but that doesn't change unless you change the schedule. You change the curriculum. You change the district mindset. And so you really do need to start at the top. That, that's a hard process, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I mean, part of what is fascinating if you look out across the room and you say, what are each of you trying to accomplish? And how many of you simultaneously are trying to talk to district uh, level people or having to talk to that IT person or having to talk uh, to individual teachers? It's just pretty stunning amount of noise and trying to get that level of change. Uh, that's exactly what drove our, our pivot, is our first product was very robust. We were proud of it. It was selling well. But we needed to do that kind of sale. It had to be to, uh, we weren't selling directly into districts, but the equivalent in enterprises or, or higher education institutions. And we just realized that sales motion was going to be so uh, long right. that it was going to kill us. And so we borrowed from Slack and everybody else and thought, well, if we have a direct-to-consumer play, at least we can get some interaction and usage, and at very least kind of a free demo that people can use uh, pretty quickly, um, and then move up the food chain from there. It was sort of a Trojan horse kind of strategy exactly. to get then adopted further up. So I think this conversation is hitting on the biggest elephant sitting in this room. And so if I could expand on that. I've seen everybody's solutions, and Ulrich's I know quite well because we're <laughs> partners in it. And these are wonderful solutions that really do well by teaching and learning, well thought out, well implemented. And this room is full of wonderful solutions. How many of you offer a solution in the room, a software solution? How many of you require somebody to log on to it? How many of you hold grades? How many of you hold the notion of a class space, a roster? 
How many of you create reporting and insights and dashboards? How many of you fit into an ecosystem that takes less than 10 minutes to implement? Really? <laughs> I don't think so. I am a recovering education CIO, twice over. And I think the major elephant in what you're hitting upon is we make so much noise for that curriculum person as a community that, in fact, the promise of what we all offer is obfuscated by the challenge of getting it to work together. And the truth is, it's distracting. McGraw-Hill obviously operates at scale. We know how to sell into any district and any university in the world. We think we're pretty good at it. And we honestly wish it took less energy. But what we hear back time and time again is that the power and promise of ed tech is that, a promise, more than a reality. Not because we can't machine grade essays, we can do it really well. Not because we can't take the noise away and help that person learn those 16,000 or 1,600 learning objectives, we can do it. But the issue is when you want to pull it all together from all of us, it's a lot of work. So how many of you remember the dawn of TCPIP? Anybody? So I was at Bolt Brannock and Newman when we were doing packet switching for ARPANET and for military simulations. I then went to Crosscom when we did ATM switching. If it had stayed as difficult as it was then to get a computer network to operate, there would be no internet. But this convergence happened on this thing called TCPIP and Ethernet. And we all agreed to use it. How many of you did email in the early <coughs> 90s? Anybody? How many of you were old enough to do it? No, anyway. All right. So CC Mail, Lotus Mail, CompuServe. What happens if your friends and you were on those three different networks back then? You didn't talk. And then in the mid 90s, there were these broker gateways that you paid a lot of money to to talk. And then what happened? The internet protocol for email was agreed upon and ratified. And today, do you care what email provider anybody uses? For better or for worse, that's why you all have like 700 emails in your inbox right now that you haven't answered, right? <laughs> but you rely on it. I'd like to go back to that prior <laughs> world you described. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's nostalgic. That's wonderful. So the, the real point is it's not just the selling model is tough. It is. It's really tough. And I think that's why Ulrich and I decided to partner, because Ulrich lead, led and leads a super innovative organization. And we think McGraw innovates really well, too. But we also know how to get into market really well. And I think that saved you a lot of energy. Yeah. But it's, it's beyond that. It's also just, how do we get it all to work together? And when we get it all to work together without toll booths and gateways and jumping through hurdles, I guess I would ask you to think about then what does ed tech mean to the world? And it's the combination of the two that's going to allow really beautiful ideas to get into market faster, more so than a freemium upsell. Because with a freemium, I still have to get it to work if it's going to be in my core curriculum. And that's still a ton of work. And by the way, that challenge exists in enterprise, too, because we have to deal with, can you integrate with Salesforce and exactly. with Oracle? And so similar conversation. I think there are two other aspects of what Stephen is saying that is really critical as well. So one of them is that um, we fundamentally know where personalized learning, which is the area that I'm an expert in, where that could be and could be much further ahead than where we are now. But, but we're also up against, if we move too fast, we, it's the same thing as if you if you're a sports coach and, and you take a beginner golfer and ask them to hit a 300-yard drive, it doesn't work. We need to take it step by step. So part of the reason why we decided this really boring approach that it, there would be very few VCs who would have put money in, in my business plan 10 years ago. For the very reason that it, was, it, was, it didn't have a hockey stick, um, it was teaming up with just one player, um, and it was to build it on top of what teachers were already doing, the books. 
build something that was adjacent to the book. Then the next step was, let's now take the ebooks they were beginning to use and make them personalized and adaptive so that you could, you could it is truly a Trojan horse approach. But that's just, one of the, that's just one of the reasons why we should be careful how fast we, or some of us are investing mindfully and not going straight to where we know we could be with personalized learning. The other one is that it's a wild west out there right now where that many schools are completely, uh, so one thing is single sign-on and, and technical integration. The other one is how do, how do they actually know what they're buying? Right. Uh, this complete confusion about what is personalized learning, what is adaptive learning, at some point, we were trying to separate on how, how adaptive it was, and a competitor showed up one day. We called it super, he called it hyper. And that's the <laughs> being like, now, then we realized this was a complete, like, worse than the presidential debates right now. <laughs> um, Not so, really. Uh, they're worse. No. <laughs> Sometimes, at least. So, Although the but, plagiarism checker turned out to be important in the. We got yes. <laughs> you should have seen our Twitter feed that day. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> Just incredible. <laughs> So fundamentally, I think what we need is we need standards and we need to align on what, what is it we call this? How do we build yardsticks so that we can help schools measure that? And one of the impressive things that GSV has supported is an organization in Chicago I, I joined the board of recently called Leap Innovations. And I think look to them for, for helping setting these standards moving forward, being, being as a facilitator of how do schools actually take vet and implement things and actually measure whether it works. So I think that's, that's the other big confusion point or ob obstacle to moving faster. And if I could highlight like, another elephant in the room, it's procurement. And, and we all know this, but there's a kind of technical standard, but there's a kind of buying standard that, uh, frankly, I can't believe hasn't been, we haven't cracked this. Um, the fact that, and we've all been at all sides of these tables, but the fact that we have to go to 16, if you're doing working in K-12, 16,000 individual purchasing units, and there isn't even a node of 10 districts or three states that say, if you give me the standard that I need, and you give me a functionality that has some proven efficacy on certain kinds of learning outcomes, we're all gonna buy you. And so as a startup, you're, you know, you're gonna make it if you deliver for these particular learning outcomes. I think it's incredible that we don't have the kind of purchasing uh, collective that transformed, for example, vaccine development and pandemic preparedness. Mm -hmm. This has been done in, in, the, in the world of, of pharma uh, through uh, instruments that the UN and WHO and the Gates Foundation created. Um, the, the market failure problem isn't architecturally that different in K-12. And uh, it, it's, it just bemuses me that we don't have those kinds of buying collectives that allow entrepreneurs to have an incentive to go for it because they know if they hit that market, um, uh, they're going to be able to scale. But that's where all, all education is local. It's locally funded in K-12. But there are a lot of local people who agree on what personalized learning looks like, what modularity looks like, what formative assessment needs to look like, how we build equity and access into our strategies. Um, I mean, I worked with the Innovation Lab Network that was created sure. by the Subsky Foundation and CCSSO. Very, very clear uh, design specifications. We never managed to actually get a buying collective on top of those. Yeah. So it's local, but there's a lot of agreement on some local jurisdictions about what they need to buy. But what healthcare has shown is that you need a larger, you need a larger consortium or, of stakeholders than just these spot initiatives where somebody decides, now we have some standards over here. Because what if those standards are completely um, incompatible with the way I think about personalized learning, and, and we happen to have made 1,500 of them. That's where American Heart is a good example to look to for how did they convene in the 70s for agreeing on resuscitation guidelines across the world, both among scientists and, and um, industry stakeholders and others brought them together and, uh, and actually agreed across the entire industry of resuscitation. We can agree that these are the golden standards for how to treat patients with this kind of condition. As, as long as they're so spot, uh, uh, scattered around as they are right now, they're not really helpful because they cannot be used to establish those free market forces that, that we are all trying to open up. But I, so, I would also, I agree with you first of all. It boggles my mind at times, but it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle we all, and especially the, the startups in the room, are navigating. So assume it's not going to change for five years, because it probably won't in five years. And I can promise it won't. Yeah. <laughs> so the real question is you have a very unique buying pattern. You have market behaviors that are deeply entrenched through decades of tradition. And we have a populace that desperately needs what you all are designing and building. 
There's no doubt about that the collective ability in this room to change education for the better is enormous. So then I think the real question is, within those constraints that aren't going to move, how do we operate? How do we support each other? How do we live in an ecosystem where many of us can and should thrive? And how do we as entrepreneurs and innovators within these constraints accelerate? I think really that's the question we need to focus on versus hoping somehow somebody's going to make these markets more rational because in my planning period, it's not happening. Maybe this is a good point to uh, open it up. Uh, you know, this issue, if you look in sales, at Salesforce uh, as an example, they've been acquiring lots of things around the standard that they've created. And that may be one model that will ultimately happen. You almost always start with hundreds of companies, uh, and then it evolves into something that has a broader offering that's cloud-based, mobile-based, has all the characteristics you think it ought to have. But uh, we don't. Maybe you're doing that. Uh, trying in, try, in a yeah. small way. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, open it up uh, for questions. Yeah. <coughs> One thing that has been mentioned is privacy, and uh, <clears throat> that might sound like I'm making things even more complicated, but the truth is that in the area of privacy, <clears throat> as in the area of interoperability, there are uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are initiatives for standardization um, that have been helpful from the industry for the industry, referring to the SIIA uh, pledge, mm -hmm. referring to IMS Global. So, I'm wondering if you can talk about that. And yeah, it'd be a little bit less gloomy. <laughs> From McGraw-Hill's point of view, privacy is paramount, right? So education has to be the safest place for teachers and students to try on ideas. You know, to that end, when I was a junior at Bowdoin College, I really didn't get along with my constitutional law professor, and so I decided my thesis at the end of the semester would be there is no such thing as justice. The American Constitution is a farce. And I wrote a 40-page paper on that. I would really not <laughs> like that to be on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't really believe in the argument. What I believed is Professor Morgan had annoyed me all semester, and I was going to get under his skin. And to his credit, he enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> so we believe deeply in privacy. We expect every ed tech to allow things like opt out, to respect the sanctity of the student-teacher relationship, to really live FERPA, not just in sort of the word, but in the spirit of it. The pledge is written as a little bit imperfect. I think if you read the pledge, it actually is a bizarre set of statements. The intent behind it is good. Um, and I would, being on the board of IMS, every standard IMS creates is absolutely with privacy in mind. So I think if you look, at what's really happening in the impl implementation of ed tech, it's more of a non-issue than an issue. I think the fact that people talk about it is important, but if you look at, I would argue, almost every provider in this room, they're implementing ed tech in all the right ways, and we should hold each other responsible for doing that, absolutely. So just uh, uh, a random question, but if I uh, looked at Facebook, I went inside Facebook, and I said, what do you know about each and every one of the students or the people on the panel? What do you think they know? They know everything. Everything about me. Right. They know your health. They know all sorts of stuff. It's very interesting to try to protect in one domain where it's leaking badly uh, across the rest of the uh, uh, space. Well, and I think there's a tension there because at least a quarter or a third of the companies in this room will make a claim at some point along the way that aggregation of data and collection of information about students is a key part of their value proposition. Right. Um, and that they're using student data in a way that improves some experience for a university or a school. Um, and so on the one hand, you can say that we care a lot about student privacy and student data and all that. And on the other, you're turning around and saying, and we're going to monetize that data in a meaningful way. Um, and that's a really hard pair of statements to make at any given time. And it feels like, to me, the way to try and bridge that, rather than making claims of 
total anonymity and total uh, sort of scrubbing of student data, which is uh, unrealistic. It's wild transparency about what that data is being used for. Um, where is it being shared? What exactly is, uh, is being done with it? Who's handling it uh, within your institution? Who's looking at it, if anyone, possibly no one? Um, and, and not trying to obfuscate or avoid the question, but say, you know, this is the direct impact that we're going to have on your school because we are trying to analyze and understand what's going on with the users of our product. And these are what we're not going to do. These are the things that we can commit to not doing this data because it's the uncertainty about I'm giving away all this information and I have no control over it anymore that is the biggest driver of concern over privacy. And if you're very clear about where you're drawing lines, I think that helps a great deal in the conversation. And I think from our perspective, privacy is table stakes. But I think the concern that we get even more is ownership, data ownership and content ownership because we aggregate and people curate content. And, and having very clear statements about what you get back if you leave our platform and how that happens, um, frankly, is, is a bigger conversation than privacy, which people just expect you know, that they, they're going to get the right answer. Yeah. yeah. Deborah, I'm required to call on you. You know, there was a lot of jostling, uh, muscular jostling, I would say, over the term adaptive, right? And so, you know, people saying one company is smoke and mirrors and one company's not, and what is this, and how do you define it? And I think maybe some, you know, we've somewhat gravitated toward the concept of personalization to create a bigger umbrella. Can you guys speak to that and what, you know, what makes a, you know, a fraudulent claim around adaptivity and what, what is, you know, true adaptivity in your own kind of definitions? So, so I think that um, it's, you, it is okay to say that you're adaptive, if, even if you just adapt once a week. But I think it's, it's a matter of <laughs> explaining like, how it works. And, and I think this is also an education path for, for the uh, buyers and the users of this, that adaptive is, is not, a, it's not a magic thing, or personalized is not a magic thing. It's how much and how often and how well. So it's, it's a matter of frequency. Um, so we, on average, we adapt every 30 seconds um, and, and recalculate the entire model. That may be too much. Um, then it's a matter of the, the, what happens at those interactions with the learner. How, how high quality is that? If it's a flashcard, it's relatively low quality. It's almost useless. It's actually it's 0.01% worse than random. Um, <laughs> so don't, don't do that. Just a quick trick. Um, but if you, if you have a really well-crafted, statistically validated interaction where the distractors are based on millions of data, that's a different thing, so that's also important. And then the, the remedial interactions when you see l larger gaps, because adaptivity also is a matter of, one thing is just pure memorization and retention of facts, but the other thing is what do you do with larger semantic misunderstandings? So how big gaps can you close? In other words, if you compare it to medicine, how big wounds can it heal? And some things are adaptive where it can, it can handle small scratches, and other things can probably grow a small new limb. Um, none of us can build an entire knowledge model from scratch because that's where we know that adaptive might be able to get to, to understand everything there is to know about an arm from scratch, but that's not a good way to use the current adaptive system. So I think it's, it's a very nuanced discussion where you need to look at frequency, quality of interactions, and, style, and how, how big gaps it can close. And I would add locus to that because when we think about personalization versus adaptivity, for us it's about, it's about where you're doing it. And we've tended to say that adaptive learning platforms help personalize the journey on what tends to be a linear learning progression. So if you've got course sequences or learning progressions that tend to have a trajectory, we're going to allow you to speed up or skip elements of it. But that journey is predefined and therefore it's adaptive. Whereas for us, personalization is about almost like dynamic ontologies that surface from the interaction. So if you take the work of Margaret Herridge or Eva Baker and, and turn that into um, the kind of social behavioral work that we're doing, um, we think personalization is about a more chaotic set of um, uh, pathways that emerge from usage rather than predefined. And so for us, that locus of what you're measuring and changing is very important. So, so herein I, lies yeah. the challenge. We're having discussions about three different educational moments at the moment, right? So one is about sort of how I learn, I think, more in the workplace and more after I've got a certain set of abilities. 
One is about how do I gather basic numeracy and literacy, and I think one is in the middle. And so the term itself is kind of irrelevant. I, I would answer you by saying, who cares? Now what I care about is, does this courseware, does this learning technology in the context of a curricular set of goals, in the context of a certain pedagogy or pedagogies, make the teacher and student more efficient, more effective, and more socially connected? And is there evidence that it does that? And then, of course, if there's evidence, I want to ex understand at some level how it works. But am I ever going to distill all of that into a globally agreed term of art on adaptive? I hope I'm retired before that happens, because yeah. it's such a fool's errand. And to add on to that, from a user-centric point of view, if you're a professor at a community college or if you're a teacher in a high school and you're struggling with what to do with your students and how to help them learn, you don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what would really help me out is a blockchain. Or, <laughs> or, or what would really help me out is something that was running on Amazon Web Services. Like fundamentally, they're not looking at the products that they're buying in terms of what technology is running that thing. Um, and I think we sort of forget that with adaptive learning because the term there is almost something that's user-centric and almost something that uh, indicates what's going to change in the user's life. Um, but it's not, it's a technology, and it's a tool that we use to get to a user outcome. Right. Uh, and so the message that we need to send when we're talking to buyers and then in onboarding when we're talking to users and throughout their usage is how is our product going to change what it is that you do in your day? Um, and how are you going to be happier as a result of purchasing our product? And if you can send that message, it's sort of irrelevant what your definition of adaptive is. Um, and that's a really, key difference in the language that we use. And just building on that, I mean, it's again, it's, what are we all being hired to do? Teach math, teach writing, teach reading, teach social studies, teach science, teach chemistry. To, I really agree with your point. I've never walked into a classroom and they said, oh my gosh, I love it that you use AWS. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. I was wondering if you can, is this on, I think? I'm just wondering if you can combine your talk yesterday with what we're hearing today, because what was really exciting for me yesterday was this concept of hugely disruptive approaches to industry, and I feel like what we've just said is nothing's going to change in the next five years, let's lock arms and work together. And I would just love your kind of view on that from an entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, I'm the guy who did Segway, you recalled it. Uh, <laughs> There's some evidence uh, you should take it with a grain of salt. I think this um, issue of trying to find something that is simultaneously less expensive but orders of magnitude more effective, and then having it evolve so you don't feel like it's uh, going to be obsolete. I think what you're really talking about is something that improves in outcomes over time as a result of use, yep. which is a terrific way to sell a product, um, and you know ultimately what great companies do. So, I, I, I think the challenge in this is simply that there's no decision maker, there's no single group of people you can go and get adoption, and then have the disruption spread like wildfire because the 16,000 nodes are not connected and. Uh, the noise in the system is almost overwhelming. The standards are not there to move data back and forth in a coherent way or have one, or, uh, one software solution talk to another software solution so jointly the product that they create is better. And I don't know what the, um, uh, I'm retired. Can I have a comment? <laughs> can I build, can can I have a comment on that? that? So I, so I ran that startup that McGraw-Hill eventually acquired, and um, we've kept it a bit under the radar, but it's one of the largest acquisitions in EdTech the latest years. But it was boring. It was not as sexy as thinking that we invent this thing that comes right out of a sci-fi movie and immediately poof, blows up. It was, a, it was a journey that it didn't take that many years, actually. It took, it took six years? Six years. Six years or so. It transformed one of the largest publishers. Like when, we start, when I started working with them, they had 1,000 people in editorial and higher ed that were making books. When I left a few months ago, um, Steven and the other guys on the team, um, 
I think we have less than 200 left in that organization that makes books. The rest of them makes a completely different kind of curated content. So it is one of the biggest technological impacts that it takes has seen the last 10 years, but it's a, it's a boring one in some ways. That it's, it isn't this super sexy Silicon Valley high-flying thing, but it had a big impact because we acknowledged some of these limitations of what the market dynamics are. And I think it's important to be precise about our pessimism because we're, I think, talking about th at least three markets. There's K-12, and that's where we're saying, you know, everybody's saying, don't, Nelson, don't, don't hold your breath for your buying collective, right? Uh, but then there's higher ed, and we work mainly in the enterprise learning talent and learning development and innovation space. And I think that's moving incredibly quickly. The, the, the trajectory of change in the chief learning officer job and what they're looking for is astounding, very, very exciting. I think K-12 is moving much more quickly. Good things are happening in K-12, but we've got some systemic structural uh, challenges. And so I think it isn't that we're all you know, just saying, yeah, we'd love to be disruptive or whatever, but we're never going to get there. It's saying different industries allow us to do different things. And that's why companies like mine are diversified across those spaces, because we can go faster in some areas. Yeah, and, and so I'm, op I'm optimistic everything's going to change. So don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I was also one of the people who helped create garden.com and pet.com when I worked for ATG, so I was in the tech bust. But all do I'm you have the sock, though? I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's Actually, important stuff. I do. And that was the first personalized commerce site. What I'm saying is drink in the constraints. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't beat your head because, you know, in consumer tech, change happens one way. In retail, change happens another way, and don't lament the fact that change in education isn't going to happen those ways. It isn't even going to happen the way change in healthcare is happening, because there's no single payer attempt to drive change. But it is going to change. It's already changed. Look at K-12 and higher ed five years ago and 10 years ago. It's changed dramatically for what those institutions can handle. Right? These are high-risk endeavors. How many of you have kids? How many would be happy to have your child redo fourth grade because that curricular experiment with technology was just a total screw up? <laughs> How many of you ever bought? I, I skipped fourth grade. Well, you're special. <laughs> How many of you bought from LL Bean ever? How many of you bought the wrong thing? <laughs> what was the consequence other than UPS made more money taking it back? Right, so we're in a high risk place. We can't do harm. We can't do harm at every grade level. But change will happen, and it is happening, because resources are constrained, outcomes aren't where they need to be, and there's pressure coming from every direction. Yeah. And you all are driving the change, so all I'm saying is do it thoughtfully. But I, I think the issue Ted was talking about in higher ed is going to be particularly pressing. So you're not going to see massive new cost pressures in K through 12, Higher ed is 100% out of control and needs to have a radical transformation in the quality of the effect they have on kids and on productivity, and they need to do things very differently. I think that pressure is going to cascade back more uh, forcefully. So it'll be interesting. Uh, yeah. Can you guys uh, comment on how important it is for folks in this room to be paying attention evidence about learning, paying attention to evidence about learning, uh, to learning science, to generating high quality evidence about efficacy, and to creating relationships with researchers who have similar views about high quality evidence. What, what should we all be thinking about along those dimensions? Life and death important. Like it is, there is, it is the number one thing that, where, where we can justify the cost of the systems we're building. If we don't measure what we are, measure the impact of what we're doing, yes, we're in the early stages of the science around it, but for me, that is monumentally important. For me too, I can't think of anything more important. That's why I was saying the buying collectives are important, not just because it gives us guaranteed cash, but probably more because it says, a formative assessment needs to give me this kind of data so that I can measure this kind of learning outcome for this kind of population. If we have those kinds of demands, 
our product development roadmaps are going to reflect that. The way we talk to our VCs is going to reflect that. And if, we're, if the market isn't giving that, then, then we need to figure out what that is. In our case, we've got learning scientists and education specialists as advisors, to, and we have full transparency with them on what we're doing so that we can make sure that we have an independent view. But if we're not doing this, I don't, we are doing harm because incredible resources are being squandered that Agreed. aren't improving learning outcomes, and what are we here for? Well, and I think a, a useful thing to remember here is the understanding and education of the audience of buyers. You know, Brewer, I've sat with you in the room at CMU and listened to talks from Ken and Vincent and all of the group of learning scientists that if they made the presentations that I see in some ed tech ventures, they'd be skewered and hung out, out the window. <laughs> um, it just wouldn't be acceptable in a top tier research institution to make a tenth of the claims that I've seen in a lot of presentations. The reason that they can get away with it, though, is that Many of the buyers, in this case, do not have the academic background to walk through, you know, what are the things that would be got, caught in peer review. Um, and sort of our challenge as an industry is to stop letting ourselves get away with it, because there's a lot of companies that get away with it right now, and we should hold ourselves to a higher standard, I think. I think, that, I think that's spot on, and I think to answer your question directly, Bor, it is a symbiotic relationship with the academy, with academic researchers with real rigorous research and technology developers and curriculum developers and teachers and students. And you have to have a product development life cycle that starts with research, that can quickly prototype, that can do rigorous trials, and that can iterate. It is the farthest thing from a one and done you could imagine. But that is all still rare. It is. But I think what's really going to happen is there's going to be a shakeout in this industry. Like the amount of capital flowing into ed tech over the past five years has been tremendous. It's outstripped the result. Mm -hmm. And at least a dozen of them were based on learning styles inventory, which is one of these <laughs> hoaxes. Yeah. And I think the, the investment piece is really important because there's a, a really important role for investors in the room, to, particularly if you, if you have impact in any of your, your strategies, is to actually look at what the key sort of Aikido points or pressure points are in the system and to create a kind of market map or, or learning map of where entrepreneurs should go. So if you care about middle school math, uh, as a critical point, why not, be, why not have that be part of your investment thesis or English language learning or critical thinking? Yep. If investors actually helped map the market for entrepreneurs and then drove the market via their investments to those points, that plus the buyers becoming more educated and more demanding could be very transformative to people like us who are trying to figure out where do I sit in the market? And even just if you care about your investment, shouldn't you want to know that what you're investing in is being built on real rigor? Yeah, I, I, I worry have coming and representing Harvard that rigor is a requirement for, I think, uh, longevity and brand name are more critical. <laughs> 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 One more question. So I've heard, don't hold your breath for a buyer's collaborative. Um, education isn't going to change rapidly in the next five years. You have to just keep selling, right? You have no, to keep no, informing. No, 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 no. Okay. What I said is don't expect some of these constraints to disappear. Okay. So and I said education is going to change. All right, change. I'm paraphrasing poorly, but I got it. So here's the question. How many of you actually say that on a regular basis to the school-wide system, to the potential buyers? I know it sounds strange, but they're not hearing we have to change rapidly. Right? So, so we're all innovating. We all know these things, but they're not hearing that message. How many times and how can you relay that in your conversations? I disagree. I, I, disagree. I think they're hearing it all the time. Absolutely. And when you, when you work with schools, districts, states, there is nothing but talk about disruption and innovation. They're asking Clay Christensen to come speak, and you've got incredible innovation happening, particularly at the classroom level. It's astounding. But the innovation curve looks like this rather than like this because there's a system at equilibrium that eats all of that for lunch. And so I think people are talking about it all day long, and they're heroic people just keeping at it every single day. And they come to people like us and go, we need it, can you help us? Um, but it's all very subversive, and they're trying to do this in spite of the system, not because of it. So I wouldn't, 
uh, say that they're not talking about it. We just have to deal with those systemic barriers that are getting in the way. I actually think it's a blended world. If you look at Houston Integrated School District, if you look at ASU, if you look at Minerva, if you look at Southern New Hampshire University, if you look at Northeastern University, if you look at Ivy Tech, there's change happening, right? So it's, first thing, it's not all one big monolithic point of view. There are leaders driving change. The only point is there are some constraints that if you got three years of worth of cash, don't try and move certain constraints to be That's successful. Right. That's the point. Yeah. The other big point is, yes, change is happening. Make sure you're rigorous. Make sure you're relevant. And make sure you know how you're actually helping to solve a given problem. So uh, thank you guys for sharing your thoughts. Uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, I think this uh, holds for everyone in the crowd that uh, this is truly important work or we're going to lose uh, hope for generations to come and that would be criminal to do. But I'm very optimistic having heard what you uh, have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.